Welcome to Vancouver Island and Victoria, the beautiful capital city of British Columbia, where it's peaceful and serene, and where the bloom of springtime comes early. Where there is still time to pause for tea with a touch of elegance. And the people have never lost a rich sense of tradition. This is a part of Canada that Uniroyal curlers have not seen. Where the seat of government is a structural landmark by day and by night. Here in March of 1987, His Honor Lieutenant Governor Robert Rogers led the parade of the finest junior curlers in the world into the Esquimalt Sports Center. This moment is the realization of two years of planning and dedicated work by local event organizers and volunteers. Forty young men representing ten teams here to challenge each other in a week-long competition for the Uniroyal World Championship Trophy in a royal and ancient game played with sticks and stones. <laughs> Victoria's organizing committee was headed by co-chairman Ken and Zell Moore. David Schaub, president of the championship sponsor, welcomed all to this, the 13th annual Uniroyal. It is particularly rewarding to be associated with an event that develops the skills and fosters the young people from around the world. To all of the competitors, all of us at Uniroyal say, good curling. Victoria had a chance to salute its own national champion with the entry of the Uniroyal banner. The Pat Sanders team, fresh from its victory in the Scott Tournament of Hearts in Lethbridge, had the honor always reserved for a local curling champion. Two weeks later, they would reign as ladies world champions for 87. Raising the Uniroyal banner is the cue for International Curling Federation President Philip Dawson. Your Honor, it is with very great pleasure that I formally declare open for play the 13th Uniroyal World Junior Curling Championship. The Victoria Committee chose Bernie and Lindsay Sparks as honorary co-chairman for the Uniroyal, and the crowd paid tribute to Sparksy's runner-up finish in the briar in a most appropriate way. With the protocol and ceremonies complete, the Uniroyal curlers took to the ice. Norway started the round robin with two losses, but both were last rock cliffhangers in bowing to Scotland and Switzerland. Toure Torbrotten was the skip, with Anton Grimsmo playing fourth stone. They recovered to become a playoff contender and eventually defeated West Germany 6-4 in an extra end tiebreaker for fourth place. Darren Kress was the lead on Scott Brown's American team in the Uniroyal at Dartmouth in 86. Back this year as a skip, he saw his success as a boost for curling in North Dakota. Oh, it's great. It, it promotes the curling so well because in our hometown, for me going to World two years in a row, the junior program has picked up like 80%. In Victoria, his team was in contention for a playoff berth until losing its final game in the round robin to Scotland. One of the many team mascots, Garfield's buddy, Odie, a good luck figure for West Germany. The Germans also had a pre-game ritual to wish each other good fortune. And longtime Uniroyal booster Bob Grierson likes the shots teams like this are capable of making. I think I've seen some of the best games of culling and junior culling than, uh, than uh, what I've seen in the seniors. Andy Capp's team got as far as the fourth place tiebreaker. Sweden hasn't had a Uniroyal winner since 1982, but never is very short on fan support. Uniroyal Goodrich president David Schaub is a fan of all the curlers. I love seeing these youngsters from around the world do their thing. A tough extra end loss to the Swiss in the final round denied a playoff spot for Sweden.
Pascal Thiriot's foursome was the first from Paris to play in a Uniroyal. The French team was given a shocking baptism when Switzerland crushed them 17-2 in the first round. During round-robin play, they lost seven other games against fifth international competition. But they had their bright moment against Italy, winning 12-2. Switzerland had a highly regimented approach. Coach Pierre-Yves Grivel had a control plan for diet and exercise with daily physiotherapy. It seemed to work. The Swiss were stamped as definite contenders after beating Canada 8-3 in round six. And it never hurts to have a booster on the local committee. The, the shots they made were incredible. I haven't seen curling at this level. Um, the, the fellows all curl extremely well. Hugh McFadden's Canadian team was a highly competitive unit. For the last two years, curling had been paramount in their lives. Representing a country with a Uniroyal record of five gold, five silver, and one bronze medal finish in 12 previous editions, McFadden's Winnipeg Quartet knew what was expected. The skip was also ready for the challenge. I think anyone who gets a chance to play in a world championship is pretty privileged. Beating Scotland 6-4 in the round robin was a high point for McFadden. Curling is primarily a social recreation for a small group of enthusiasts around Cortina. Despite this, Italian teams have been good enough to compete in world-class curling for many years. Skip Stefano Farinato's foursome celebrated a 9-4 victory over Denmark and a five-ender scored against Norway but struggled against the rest of the best of international teams throughout the week. How about this for a rock garden? It was built by Denmark and West Germany. The two guards form a narrow port the Danes would like to go through. Skip Jorgen Larsen looks at the possibility from a stone's eye view. Superfan Jack Crawford of East York has seen them all in 13 years and says this is typical. You know, well, greatest curling in the world. Play more shots that people would never think of playing. These kids are exciting to watch and they play great games. Denmark beat the United States and France, but didn't make the port against the Germans. There's Joan Grant and June Perry, who conducts morning class at the Uniroyal, and who wonder if Scotland can repeat its victory of 1986 in Dartmouth. Douglas Dryborough led a very confident team into Victoria, guided by coach Alex Torrance. It was the realization of a major goal for Dryborough. Oh, the Uniroyal is a great competition. I've been trying for so long to get here before I came here. I mean, it was seven years, so I've always wanted to be here. It's Great to be here, it really is. Just to be part of it is fantastic. Although extended to an extra end by Germany, Dryborough was dynamite when he had the hammer. His only serious mistake in round-robin play came in the 10th end against Canada when he selected a dubious shot and gave up a two-point steal for Scotland's only defeat. Canada and Scotland shot 77% in Victoria, but curling internationalist Richard Harding hopes to see improvements elsewhere. The one sad thing about it is that the, the, those teams who are the weaker ones haven't progressed a little bit and we haven't got some challenges from new curling countries yet. That'll maybe come in the next year or two and I certainly hope it does. Perhaps with Olympic recognition in the next uh, 18 months and some uh, play at the Olympics, that'll bring it to the attention of newer curling countries. One, two, go! There was another contest or two in Victoria. The curlers and visitors learned about logging skills. to the sports center and Bob Pickin takes it from here. Curling is a sport that's enjoyed by roughly a million and a half people around the world. It's for seniors, for juniors, for men and women. Regulatory bodies like Curl Canada and others in Europe are recognizing the fact that youngsters should be introduced to the game properly. We are seeing clinics and seminars develop all over and for the first time we have one this year at the Uniroyal. Just right, okay. Let's put your shoulder up a little bit. That's it, yeah. Arm up. Good. Perfect. 
Curling also has new technique and equipment for ice makers. Al Swanson of the Esquimalt Center has the latest in both. And he says the Uniroyal could even be held in Guadalajara, Mexico. We're still in Victoria, though, and the 87 semifinals. It's Canada versus Norway, and Scotland meeting Switzerland. Hugh McFadden came out attacking, and after three ends, Norway was down seven to nothing. But here on the fourth, McFadden's final shot left two Norwegian counters. Norway's fourth shooter, Anton Grimsmo, had a free draw to get his team back in the game. Jan Thorsen and Dag Shellstad show you the proper brush position and how to use them. The draw was good, three points, and Norway had cut Canada's lead to four. The other favorite, Scotland, also started quickly and led six to three after six ends. But Switzerland got something going here on the seventh. Marcus Egler came around that center guard. And the Swiss were lying two with Douglas Dreiber's last stone remaining. Most of the shot stone was exposed as third Phil Wilson gave Dreiber the intern ice. Look out now, that area to the left of center is very straight. It didn't curl. And the two-point steal closed the gap to 6-5 in favor of Scotland. Back in the other semifinal, Canada had maintained its advantage. It was 10-5 after seven ends, and time was running out for Norway. McFadden was looking for a clincher with a chance to draw behind cover. Norman Gould and John Lang watch it closely. And they try to bury it. He couldn't have placed it much better. Norwegian fourth Grimsmo was really in difficulty. He had to try the double raise with precious little margin for error. The brushers worked to keep it on line, but it pulled too much. Canada scored again, and Norway knew it was a futile chase. They conceded an 11-5 victory, and McFadden's team was into the championship final. Two sheets over, Switzerland had tied it up and forced an extra end. The Swiss skip Igler wanted a hit and roll with his last stone. Not much roll, I'm afraid, and Dreibra had an open takeout with his hammer to wrap it up. The only Swiss hope was that Dreibra was not as deadly as usual. Perfect, and Dreibra now thinks about Canada. Oh, they're a great team, they're a great team. They're well capable of beating us if we go slightly off the ball. And they, they could hammer us, or we could do the same to them. It's going to be a close game. I'm looking forward to it. They play a pretty balanced game. I think when the score is close, they're going to they're gonna take some chances and get rocks and play, and we're willing to do the same thing. Before we get into that final, though, another note on the social side. The quarter deck lounge in the Fraser Street Hall was jumping all week. And it's one, two, a one, two, three, four. Canadian coach Don Harvey said it was something special. Every night there's a different theme from different uh, different areas of life. It's, it's just been fantastic. We made so many more friends, and uh, we're really looking forward to meeting some of these people again sometime in our travels. Programs. Norway won the bronze, just its third medal in Uniroyal history, by beating Switzerland 7-3. That set the stage for the climax. Scotland versus Canada for the Uniroyal trophy and the 13th World Junior Curling Championship. Here are the matchups. At lead, Scotland's Billy Andrew and Canada's John Lang. Lindsay Clark and Norman Gould at second, both 75% shooters in the round robin. A super test at third between Phil Wilson of Scotland and the popular Canadian Jonathan Mead. The skips, hitman Douglas Driver, and the stylish Hugh McFadden. Gunning for gold in Victoria. Complete easy. 
Uniroyal's genius on statistics is Mort Cooper. He'll tell you the lowest score in 12 title games was 4-2 to two when Paul Gausel beat Thomas Hawkinson in that marvelous final in Grindelwald. This one in Victoria was to wind up 3-2. to two. Dryborough won the toss and blanked the first two ends. McFadden started a series of excellent shots by the skips on the third end. A fine come around hit, just a trifle too much roll. Dryborough had to worry about the center guard on his shot. He rolled to a deeper position in the eight foot circle as Phil Dawson explained the tactics to David Shaw. McFadden had virtually the same line as he did for his first shot. Come on! Come on, come on, come on. Even closer to the guard going by. And this time his shooter rolls completely behind the guard. McFadden had put some early pressure on Dryborough, who now had to go to the intern draw. He needed almost a piece of the forefoot to keep his early control. Watch his concentration. One. Jonathan was ready to put the brush on it, but no way. A one nothing lead for Scotland after four shots that were deserving of extended applause. McFadden tied the score with a single on the fourth end, and they blanked end number five. Now on six, more delicate shooting by the skips. Wait's good. Ball, ball. He's trying ball. to draw behind a corner guard. Yep. Yep. Come on. Come on. And that is McFadden at his finest. The quality of shot making that carried his team to a perfect 12 straight wins in capturing the Pepsi Junior Championship in Canada in 1986. Dryborough was put to the test again. The Scottish skip had to follow McFadden's line, hoping to draw near the Canadian rock. Just one ring. Whoa. Whoa. Clark and Andrew are ready as Wilson watched the line. They decided to brush it back beyond the T-line. The shot for McFadden now is to skin by the guard and to roll to the right to set up two counters. Come on! The Canadian supporters loved it as McFadden threw the gauntlet back at his Scottish rival. Dryborough had an open hit, but it was tricky along the center line, and he played it with medium weight. Whoa! Whoa! Coach Torrance showed a Scots approval for that one as the defending championship country took a two to one lead. McFadden blanked the seventh, but stuck on an open hit to tie it two all after eight. This was Meade's final delivery on the ninth end and they chose to try to hide at the top of the four-foot circle. Another example of the great support the Canadian team gave its skip in this game and all week. Driver didn't hesitate. He called on Wilson to peel the guard. It was a skips battle again, and McFadden's job now was to put the guard back on, and he might have to do it twice. Depending on the ice, it often is more delicate, more touchy than trying to draw behind. Set. Stop. Set. It curled too far. The Canadian counter is open, and despite the applause, McFadden knew he had opened the door. 
The Kirkati Kid leveled his sights for the intern hit. Even a slight inward roll for partial cover. And now the advantage shifts to Scotland. McFadden's under the gun, and he tried a long odds corner freeze on the Scottish Rock. Line's good. Lots of room. Wall. This time, his stone didn't curl enough, and Wilson brushed it to the back of the forefoot to be only second shot. Didn't move. That comment told the story, and McFadden and Meade know they've given Driver a chance to go two points up. The Scottish skip tried to follow McFadden's path. Hurry! He was much closer to the center line. He pushed his own stone out of the forefoot, and a big opportunity was lost for the Scottish skip. He got a one-point lead, but Canada had the hammer on the tenth. Canada's big chance on the final end came on Meade's last stone. He's attempting to get in behind a corner guard to set up a possible two that could win the Uniroyal title. It's almost fully buried, and Meade got a verbal tribute from Wilson. Sure. What followed was a shot to be remembered. An outturn come around by Dryborough. A gorgeous shot, rolling away from trouble to the open side of the house. Just three rocks left, and McFadden elected to try for a head-on freeze, his only way now to set up his deuce. He's good. Lots of room. Lots of room. Whoa, whoa. Whoa. Whoa, whoa. Whoa. The weight was almost perfect, but he froze on the corner of the Scottish stone. Driver was left with the kind of hit he made with deadly accuracy all week. The only danger was in throwing it wide. And I'm sure Douglas wiped that right out of his mind as he sat in the hack. On! Flush on the nose. And no chance now for Canada to win on this end. McFadden knew the best he could do was to tie and go to an extra end. First, he had to hit and stick. Normally, no problem. But a world title is on the line. Could he be heavy? Could Hugh have overthrown it? It's over. Scotland had its fourth Uniroyal Championship. McFadden and Clark, right there. The agony and the ecstasy. A 3-2 victory in the final, and Driver's team joined those of Andrew McQuiston, Peter Wilson, and David Aiken as Scotland's world junior champions. For McFadden, a crushing disappointment, but there can be only one winner, and this was Scotland's day. For Driver, a Uniroyal championship, a coveted goal, and how he felt ten years after he first threw a curling stone. Brilliant. Can't believe it. Can't believe it. Came here with high hopes, but to actually do it is just so fantastic. It was fabulous. Tremendous. Thanks. I'm flabbergasted. I don't know what to say. Some of Victoria's organizing committee. And what a superlative display of West Coast hospitality. The 1987 All-Stars. Stefan Tiemann of Sweden at lead, Scotland's Lindsay Clark at second, Jonathan Mead of Canada at third, and the ultimate star of this Uniroyal, Douglas Driver of Scotland at skip. The curlers pick Mead to receive the Sportsmanship Award from ICF's Philip Dawson.
Uniroyal's David Schaub presented the championship medals. Gold to Scotland. Silver to Canada. And bronze to Norway. We at Uniroyal have been very proud to sponsor this World Junior Curling Championship since its inception in 1975. And we will see you next year in Fussen, Germany. Best of luck.